Good afternoon. It is about 1.55 on February the 28th, Tuesday, and I'm just making a video to take place of the lecture we missed yesterday, and I just want to apologize for, for that. I hope the message got out quick enough that you didn't show up. Um, the, the appointment I was at lasted a little longer than expected, so I apologize again. Uh, today we're going to talk about the market revolution and it's going to be a fairly quick video because I know you only have so much attention and um, I'm going to start here with talking about something called the moral economy and the moral economy there was a time believe it or not when making a profit wasn't very important uh, in this pre-capitalist economy you're mainly worried about existing. So you're growing enough food for your own existence, you're making your own clothes, you're making your own soaps, your own candles, uh, you're going to be trading goods and services with your neighbors, and this is the way people lived all the way up until about the 1800s. Within this moral economy, men and women have very important jobs. Uh, you have women who are doing the housekeeping and making the clothes and tending the garden and taking care of the kids and cooking and even preserving the food. Men, on the other hand, are going to be building the buildings, are going to be doing the hunting, the fishing, taking care of the livestock. Uh, so two very different jobs, but you can't really have a successful life without these two different economies, if you will, coexisting. Uh, the m women have a specific economy, the men have a specific economy, and together they're going to create this family economy, this, this moral economy, if you will. Um, one particular person I want to highlight, and I have her here, her name is Martha Ballard. And she's important because she left us a very detailed diary with over 10,000 diary entries. And she talks about her life in Maine with her husband Ephraim. And it's all about what she did in this moral economy. Like she was a midwife, meaning you know, she was responsible for bringing children into this world. And she brought over a thousand children into the world. And then on top of that, she cooked and cleaned and made the the soap and made the candles and everything else. And Martha Ballard is by far our best example of this American moral economy, this pre-capitalist society. But eventually the idea of capitalism is going to develop. Adam Smith is going to write his very famous book, The Wealth of Nations, and he is going to you know, show or theorize that making money is possible. And suddenly people are going to want to, to make money. And that starts in the late 1700s and it really gets going in the early 1800s. And eventually we're going to have the capitalist society that we live in today. Now one big thing that you have to know about this development of the market economy, people start growing food and producing things specifically to sell. It's no longer about self-preservation. It's what can I sell to others to make money? And there's this specialization of labor that starts. If, if you're really good at making shoes, you're going to start specializing in shoes. Or if you're really good at making uh, barrels, you're going to start specializing in that. This is just a slide to show you where early industrialization happened. Let me move this little, this little circle here. Uh, it's a picture of... Britain in the late 1700s and all these darker brown sections that's where coal is discovered and this idea of industrialization is going to start in Britain and it's going to spread around the world eventually it's going to go from Britain to Belgium they were very closely related and then France and Germany or Russia is going to get some industrialization by the late 1800s and Industrialization is going to come to the United States fairly early. By 1793, a guy named Samuel Slater has completely memorized blueprints to a textile mill and brought them to the United States. Um, <clears throat> by World War I, the United States is able to outproduce any country, and it is the largest industrial economy by World War I start. 
Now, what are the actual factors that lead to change? Let me move this little circle over again. There we go. Um, our early industrialization is going to begin in textiles. If you are here in West Georgia, which I'm sure most of you are, just think of how many textile mills are around here or were around here. I mean, Bremen, Villarica, Carrollton, Noonan, LaGrange, uh, even Douglasville, some, a little bit, was because of industrialization based around the idea of textiles. Now, originally in the moral economy, you made all your clothes at home. Today, if I were to ask you how many people made your clothes at home, I don't know if anybody would raise their hand. But this is eventually going to develop into something known as the putting out system or the cottage system. So maybe I have a bunch of sheep and I don't want to turn all the wool into thread. I would give my wool to somebody who would then turn it into thread. I would buy the thread back from them. And then I would give the thread to somebody else who would turn it into cloth and then I would buy it back from them. Uh, the important thing though is all of this work in the putting out system is being done in other people's homes. It's being put out elsewhere for work. Eventually these early industrialists start thinking, well, why don't I have the workers come to me instead of me going to the workers? And so people start coming into one place to do the work and that's kind of where your early factories and your early mills begin. By 1790, some of these mills are going to be water powered and then by the 1840s, some, many of these mills really are going to be steam powered. This slide here is about the Boston Manufacturing Company. This is going to be the first place where all different parts of textile production are going to be done in the same location. So the spinning, the weaving, the cutting, I think they even had sheep on site. Uh, it's a very well capitalized, a very well financed textile mill. It's built and put together by a guy named uh, Francis Cabot Lowell. And they're going to produce wool so quickly and so cheaply, or I should say they're going to produce uh, cloth so cheaply that nobody else wants to do it. It's cheaper to buy it than make your own. And so Lowell, Massachusetts and this Boston manufacturing company are going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger and they're going to end up employing a lot of women. Uh, most of the women are in their teens but some are as young as four. Uh, most of the time you quit working in the mills by the, the age of 25, 26. Uh, and Lowell, Massachusetts is going to be a, really the first factory town. It's going to have courtyards and dormitories and churches and everything for the workers. Now, who are the workers? They are local women who are formerly of New England farms. They come to work. They earn money for a male relative. When they get married, they leave work. Uh, the conditions are very harsh. They can't open up the windows. Uh, if they open up the windows, it can disturb the thread and then everything can break. And also, uh, the mill owners, they would take advantage of these workers pretty much any way they could. If the mill's not making a lot of money, slow down the work and cut the pay. If the mill needs more stuff produced, let's speed it up and, and require the workers to make more. So these young women, they have no say in what's happening. All the power is in the hands of the mill workers. Here's a list of new inventions. Uh, all of these inventions here are going to be used in textile mills and slowly but surely we go from being human powered to completely machine run. Technologies are going to be really important. Uh, first of all, there's this idea of interchangeable parts. Uh, Eli Whitney, he's better known for the cotton gin, but he also came with the concept of interchangeable parts. And Eli Whitney says, you know, instead of having to replace an entire machine, why don't we just replace the individual parts? Why don't we just replace the bolts? So Eli Whitney is going to, um, he's going to develop these very intricate technical machines. They're expensive, but they can make exact replicas of existing parts. And once you can make replica parts, then you can lower the cost of running a business. Uh, uh, an example that you might understand is if your car headlight goes out, you just replace the light bulb. Before interchangeable parts, if your headlight went out, you had to get a whole new car. 
So you can see how the cost of car ownership came down. Um, a Sylvania bulb for your headlights, probably eight or nine dollars, where an entire car is, you know, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. So this idea of interchangeable parts becomes really important. We also have transportation developments. Uh, the roads are going to be improved, make it easier and quicker and faster to move things by land. But we are also going to have canals. Canals are going to make transportation extremely cheap. Even today in 2023, the majority of goods around the world are transported by water. The most famous is the Erie Canal. I should say the most famous of North America is the Erie Canal. Uh, the Panama Canal is probably the most famous today. But of the canals in North America, by far the Erie Canal is the most important. Um, and you can see here how much it cut the freight prices. So suddenly businesses were not only able to ship more goods, but they were able to do it much, much cheaper. And if it wasn't for canals, specifically the Erie Canal, the cities in Milwaukee and Chicago may not be as important as they are today. Uh, Chicago is the third largest city in the United States. And Milwaukee has over a million people. And believe it or not, Milwaukee is bigger than what uh, Metro Atlanta is. Uh, beyond canals, you get the idea of railroads. And railroads, by far, are going to produce the most important uh, transportation update after canals. Uh, railroads can travel year-round. Railroads can go uphill, downhill. Uh, through mountains if you build tunnels. Uh, railroads are going to really be game changers. So canals will get the goods to a certain point and then railroads will pick up from there and go places that um, you know maybe roads can't get to easily. Railroads start in the 1830s. By the 1840s they're pretty well established especially after uh, large coal deposits are discovered in Pennsylvania, and from there it expands rapidly. There are thousands upon thousands of miles of railroad by the Civil War. Uh, you also have communication development, specifically the telegraph. Uh, the telegraph is invented by Samuel Morse in the 1840s. Samuel Morse is also going to invent Morse code. And between the telegraph and Morse code, suddenly the world is a much smaller place. You can be living in Nowheresville, Nebraska, and you can order goods or speak to people who live in London. And uh, you really have to think of the telegraph as the internet of the day. While it wasn't instantaneous communication, it was very, very quick. Uh, prior to the telegraph, three to four months to get news from London to New York. After the telegraph, um, averaged something like six minutes. So it was very, very quick. Then we have this idea of urbanization. Um, cities, which were already important, are going to become even more important during industrialization. Uh, these ports are going to be where the majority of the goods come in. Places like New York, Boston, Savannah, Charleston. Already important, but even more stuff is going to start coming in. And these cities, specifically the cities on the coast or with water access, are going to become places where bankers are located. Investors are going to start investing and building companies. Uh, lots of money and lots of financial power is going to be in these cities. Uh, today, New York City is arguably the financial capital of the world, and that is due to this early industrialization. There's also the, the idea of where, where do you get the workers for these early factories and these early textile mills, some of it is internal migration. There are quite a few people who are going to move from the countryside into the cities and then take these jobs. But there are also a lot of people from Ireland. They moved to the United States in the 1840s because of failing potato crops and starvation. And then Germanic people are going to start coming in the 1850s primarily because of a failed revolution in 1848. Uh, generally speaking, the Irish are going to be uh, lower economic status and they don't leave the cities where they come from. So a lot of Irish people are going to come to 
to Philadelphia, New York, and Boston, and even today, uh, those three cities have a very large Irish population. Uh, Germans are going to be more middle and upper class, and so they're able to move further inland, and you end up with a lot of German people living in the Midwest, like Milwaukee and Chicago and places like that. Uh, the federal government is going to invest in businesses really for the first time, and federal governments are going to encourage business growth, and even state governments are going to get invested in things like transportation and banking and start building uh, road systems and railroad systems. Um, so I would say, just generally speaking, by 1850, if you were transported to 1850, you would start to understand the world around you. Uh, you probably wouldn't be comfortable. Your iPhone would not work, obviously. But you would say, okay, I can see how this idea of urbanization and these cities growing and and how businesses work translates to 2023. So, um, as promised, it's just a really short video for you. And if you watch this video between now, it's 2.10 p.m. on Tuesday the 28th and our midterm exam. So if you watch the video between now and the midterm exam, which is in about two weeks, email me, jason.kennedy at westgatech.edu. The email address is on the syllabus. If you email me and say, Mr. Kennedy, I watched your video, I will give you five points on your midterm exam. So it's a really quick and easy video, and it's a really quick and easy way to get five points on your midterm exam. If you watch this video, first of all, thank you. Second of all, send me an email, say I watched your video, and you'll get five points on your midterm grade. All right, that's all. I'm going to stop talking now, and uh, we'll see you on Tuesday like normal, and um, have a great week. Bye-bye.